Okay. Yeah, welcome to the last talk of Velocity Conference Berlin 2019. My name is Sabine Woszeszak, and I will tell you about a fairy tale about habits or what we can learn from Cinderella and her peers in Agile and DevOps. Sounds a little bit crazy why I want to talk about fairy tales, but I think at the end of the talk you will get it. And this is my hand for you that you are so curious to stay until the bitter end of yeah, this session. <laughs> so, so what you will hear is a little bit about the old common fairies of the Grimm brothers but also about some more modern fairy tales. You see, I play some kind of role in it, and one of my beloved mentors are coming from these modern fairy tales. And I will also bring it to real, true story of today's. And one story is about agile development, which is very popular at the moment, but as it becomes more and more popular, also because of digitization and all those things, a lot of people from other industries get in contact with agile development. And yeah, sometimes they have the impression that agile development is chaotic, they don't know what they will get in the end. They don't know what they will have to pay in the end, or that they are afraid that they get something completely different. And this came up to me over the last months more and more when I talked to customers. And I thought, what's going on? Why does this happen? And we have the Agile Manifesto. And I ask a lot of times developers have you read the Agile Manifesto? And they look at me and say, no, but they pretend to do Agile. And those who say, yes, I have, I ask, and what about the 12 principles behind the Agile Manifesto? Mm, there are principles, I don't know. So, and I don't dare to ask, what about the modern Agile approach? Do you know the four guiding lines? So they pretend, pretend on the one hand to do Agile, but they don't know about the real idea behind it, the real core behind it. This is the reason why I developed some kind of agility exercise. I'm running with teams who set up for new projects. I want to do Agile or also do it in retrospectives, where we try to challenge all those principles and try to understand what it could mean for our work. So to bring it from the more theoretical part to the real practical approach for their work. But when they don't know what it means, but they pretend to do Agile, it's somehow like playing the Agile theater. Just because everyone is doing Agile, we also have to say we are Agile. And then it's not, uh, not very strange that customers believe that Agile is more chaotic and does not bring what they really want. So what we have to do is we have to bridge this gap between the theoretical idea we are Agile to the real world Agile, what Agile will, really means and which value it brings. Who of you is doing DevOps? Okay, whom of you has heard about CAMS? Okay, <laughs> so what has CAMS to do with DevOps? CAMS are the five pillars of DevOps. And also DevOps has come into its age with 10 years now. But a lot of people I talk to who say they are doing DevOps tell me about automation. We automate everything, we build pipelines, and we do all the testing in the pipelines. But John Willis and Damon Edwards say this is more than just building pipelines and just more than building automation in. And Jess Humble later added something to it. So comes is about culture. It's about automation. This is the part everyone knows. It's about lean, reducing waste. And it's also about measurement and sharing. So much more than just 
automation. Measurement is up to date now. A lot of companies think about measuring their processes. Uh, it's important because of all the distributed systems, you need to know what's happening inside of it. But John Willis, one of the early adopters of DevOps said, if you can't get the C, which is for culture, don't bother with the A, the L, the M, and the S. If you don't understand the core culture which is necessary for doing DevOps, your whole initiative will not bring the whole value to it which it could deliver. So think about the culture. The good news, every company has a culture. No matter if they take care of it or not. The question is, is this culture supporting your initiatives or is it more harmful to them? So if you want to do agile, but your culture is not ready for that, it will harm the whole change process. The same with DevOps. When we come to companies and should help them to become more agile or to have the culture for being ready for DevOps, I really like to join meetings because meetings show a lot about the behavior, the habits which are there in the company, and they are really helpful to tell me about the culture. Habits are about culture. So if we want to change our culture within the company, we can easily start with changing our own habits. Every one of us can do this, every single one. And no CEO needs to tell us that we have to change our habits. We can make it by our own choice. And this is the good thing about it. But <clears throat> to change habits is not that easy. And the longer we are familiar with these habits, the harder it gets to change them. And it means that we have to leave our comfort zone. Yoda says, Many of the truths that we cling to depend on our point of view. So if we want to collaborate, if we want to change, we need to accept that there is more than one truth, more than my truth. Other people have their own truths, and we need to understand this. The first takeaways are, always remember the values and principles of agile and what they mean to your work. Second advice, be brave enough to leave your comfort zone. And third advice, to collaborate, we need to accept that there is more than only our truth. The good and the potty, the bad and the crappy. Maybe you remember this from Cinderella. The pigeons were helping her to sort the peas. And we can also take it for the habits. We need to find out which are the good habits and which are the bad habits. The good should come into the potty, the bad and the crappy and we can all act somehow like the pigeons in Cinderella. So this is me, why I'm telling this. We, I'm the enthusiastic enabler for Agile and DevOps. I don't call myself Agile coach, I don't call myself Scrum Master, because I'm not a fan of all the certifications. And yeah, that is why I looked for another role, and this is my job title. I'm also a lecturer, writing a lot of stuff and all those things, organizing DevOps days, which is important to all the sharing idea. So nowadays we are living in the so-called FUCA world, which is defined by volatility, uncertainty, a lot of complexity and ambiguity. And also when we look at the Canavan framework by Dave Snowden, we have here the complex habitat the complex habitat, which is the area where agile methods or DevOps are really great, where we don't know what's coming next, where we have to test and try out what's coming next. And we can't foresee what is happening. We just can check out in the retrospective what's good. Complexity is what we have to deal with today. Difficult to see, always in motion is the future, also Yoda already said. Yeah? We can't foresee the future. We have to retrospective analysis for this. If we want to deal with complexity, we need to have motivated people. People who are willing to give their best. People who are willing to improve. 
This is also part of the Agile Manifesto and the principles. Build teams around motivated individuals. And the modern approach of motivation by Daniel Pink is autonomy, mastery, and purpose as the three pillars for motivated people. And this is why we need teams who have the autonomy, who have the chance to get mastery, and who see a purpose in what they do. So we are all looking for high-performing teams to deal with complexity, with all these challenging tasks. But what does high-performing mean in this case? High-performing teams are teams who learn fast and who are able to adapt changes easily. So are these all the smartest people in the world, most intelligent, high IQ? This is not the reason behind it. It's a lot about psychological safety and feeling as a team and all those stuff. And having the freedom to make decisions. So if we want to deal with complexity, we need high-performing teams. They are able to welcome changing requirements even late in project, which is another principle in the Agile Manifesto. And they are prepared to help themselves, to help another one in the team to get out of the mud and to share knowledge. So why these fairy tales? Yeah. Stories are good because they can stick in the head. You can remember them easily, much better than theoretical approaches. And by the way, fairy tales originally have been made for, for adults, not for children. We now use them for children, but they have been made for adults, for talking about behavior, good behavior, bad behavior. So let's start with a sleeping beauty. There's always a difference between the Disney approach and the real story, the original story. So I always give you a brief idea of what I mean. There was a queen and a king, they got a baby and they were so happy that they decided to give a feast for her christening and they invited 12 of 13 fairies. Um, the story is told that the, the king only had 12 golden plates, so he could only invite 12 of them. But at the feast, near the end, the 13th of the fairies appear and she was so angry, and she put a bad spell on the baby. The spell was that the baby should die before her 16th birthday because she pricked her finger with the needle of a uh, spinning wheel. And then some of the good fairies jumped in, and they said, no, 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 this is not a good idea for a christening, and they changed the spell to she should just fall asleep until a prince came and kiss her awake full of love. So, the years went on, the parents never told her growing up girl about this spell. They just said, don't go around in the castle, never go alone, and always do what we are telling you. Somehow, at her 16th birthday, she was alone in the castle. Her parents were away, and what did she do? She said, yes, no one there. No one observing me. I can go out and I can have an adventure. She went around in the castle and she came to a room where an old lady was working on the spinning wheel. And she said, oh, can I try it out? Yes, for sure. What happened? She picked her, pricked her finger and she fell asleep. And not only she, the whole castle. And the thorn hedge grew and grew bigger and a lot of prince came and tried to kiss her awake, but they died in this thorn hedge. After 100 years of deep sleep, one prince, one brave prince managed to come through the hedge. He kissed her awake. So, what went wrong? The parents always told her not to go out. They never told her why. And they just set rules on her and prohibitions. Is this okay? When you look at the signs for being prohibited, the people are following what uh, this was written there, but they are on the, on the stand-up stand puddle boards, and yeah, maybe there's a reason behind it. So if we want to have high-performing teams to deal with complexity, are rules and prohib prohibitions good? Should we have teams which just obey 
if we want this, we have the so-called agile zombies. Acting, following rules, following plans, not using the brains. This is not the idea behind it. So if we want to have some kind of boundaries, we need to define principles, we need to define values, and we need to define the boundaries. And we need to define them just in a way which sticks in the mind. So when the times get tough, that everyone can remember and can adopt it easily to their own situation. This is the reason why I choose the approach of telling stories. If one thing is for sure, then it is that things will go wrong. And then we need to be prepared to remember what is the best way to make a decision. If people are afraid of violating rules, of violating prohibitions, they spend too much energy of their brain in being afraid and to avoid things. And this energy is not ready to be used for finding solutions. And times will bring up that people get frustrated about this, always avoiding mistakes, avoiding to violate rules. And if they are demotivated, they will sometimes hate their job will be frustrated, will be burned out, and maybe they will not be good for the team anymore. So, define principles, define values and boundaries, not rules. Tell stories which are made to stick in your head, and don't concentrate on avoidance, train for dealing with failure and imperfectness. And when I saw this song hatch, I said, this is somehow like some companies and also some individuals act. A big hatch around them because we know everything. We don't need to go out. We are the smartest company in the world. I'm the smartest developer ever. Who, he who stops being good stops, he who stops being better stops being good is something Oliver Cromwell said once. And I think there's so much truth in it. Even if we now know a lot, we still need to go on learning. <clears throat> and you know this from DevOps, CI, CD, all these continuous stuff. You can also say this is continuous improvement and continuous development of teams and individuals. Yeah, you can also put this not only on the technical side, but also on the human side and use it for that. And there's one principle which is continuous attention to technical excellence. And technical excellence is much more than only the tools you use. If you end to your training now, if you choose the quick and easy path as Vader did, you will become an agent of evil. If you decide that you know everything about good code or something like this and you don't try to write clean code, something like this, sooner or later this will come back to you and then you will have really evil times because it's not maintainable anymore. So also Yoda knows this. Go on learning, continuous improvement matters as the seventh and eighth advice. Little Redwood Heidi writing. <clears throat> her mother asked her to bring something to drink and a cake to her grandma who was sick lying in bed. The problem was her grandma was living deep in the forest, about 30 minutes walk away. And mama said, sweetie, listen, don't leave the pass. Stay on the pass, go directly to grandma. And what did sweetie say? Yes, mom, for sure. And she left. On her way to grandma, the wolf, the evil wolf came and he thought, oh, looks delicious. And he talked to her and she said, yeah, I'm going for grandma, she's sick, and I bring her something to eat. And he said, oh, wow, grandma, sick? Oh, something to eat. And then the young girl, no, on top of it, no? that's great, I need some time. And he told her about nice flowers in the forest. And he said, look, grandma is ill, go there, 
pick some flowers, bring it to her, she will be happy about this. And he led her the way into the deep forest, far away from the past, so he had time enough to go to grandma's house, ate her, slipped into her night dress and went into the bed. Little Red Road Hiding came in and she found someone lying in a bed and said, hmm, looks crazy. Grandma, why do you have such big ears? Because I want to hear you better. Wow. <laughs> she saw something went wrong, but she didn't react accordingly. So, this is some kind of mimicry. The wolf s tried to look somewhere, like somehow different. I had this last year. I wanted to book a trip via internet with an airline and yeah, it didn't work. I reached out for the airline and I was not the only one. It was so many complaints about this uh, improper possibility on Twitter since a lot of hours. But the only answer which came is IT says there is no problem. IT just checked if this website was reachable, and it was. What didn't work were the services on the website. You couldn't set the dates, you couldn't choose a flight or something like this. But, yeah, the website is still available, so there can't be a problem. The problem might be hidden somewhere deep down, not on the surface. So if people complain about this or you see something which might look a little bit strange, you need to realize this and you need to act. Do not assume anything clear your mind must be if you are to discover the real villains behind this plot. So, and there's another thing. Mama told little sweetie to stay on the path. This was a commitment, a team commitment. And team commitments are there for following. Some weeks ago, I was at, at a conference, and one participant told me, yeah, Sabine, you know, we have a lot of meetings, and we come to commitments there. But as soon as we leave the room, no one takes care of them anymore, even not the managers. And I said, okay, why do you spend time on finding commitments if you don't care about them? Just because teams are having commitments? So this is very well described in the five dysfunctions of the team by Patrick Lencioni, where he says in the middle that the lack of commitment will probably lead to inattention to results. So this is a pyramid which starts with trust, but the lack of commitment is one important thing when you have problems with yeah, creating results because you concentrate on on other stuff. It's very interesting. So take a closer look. Things sometimes are not what they look like. Stay focused on your values, principles, and goals. And don't break commitment without discussing it with the team. This is important so that everyone has the new understanding. Another story is about Hansel and Gretel. You know, there's two little children alone in the forest and didn't find home, and they come to a house of the witch, and yes, they were so hungry, and there were all the sweets outside, and they started to eat from the house, and the witch came out and said, nibble, nibble, no, who's nibbling at my little house? And the witch was not a good witch. She was a very evil one, and she had the idea that she wanted to eat the bows, Hansel and Gretel. So she put Hansel in a cage, and he should become fat there so that it's a more delicious meal. And Gretel always had to bring him chicken. But there was one thing. The witch was nearly blind. She could not see. And this was an advantage for Hansel, who was really clever. And he ate the chicken because he was hungry. But whenever the witch came and said, give me your finger, I want to see if you are fat enough, he took a chicken bone and put this chicken bone outside the cage. And the witch always said, oh, it needs some more days, yeah? Okay, sooner or later, both managed to get free and, uh, yeah. But what has this to do with agile? 
We need to measure a lot of things, but before we start to measure, we need to understand what we want to measure. And we also need to understand what is the purpose of this measure measurement? What do we want to achieve? And is this really the right way how we can measure what we want to achieve? What are these results for? This is really important. Also in the principles of the Agile Manifesto, we have this measurement topic. Working software is the primary measure of progress. The question is, what is working software? Measure the right thing, what you really need. Measure it in the right way, so that you get those results which are really helpful for you. And one more thing, define failure or success before you start to measure. Sounds crazy, but this is important. Yeah? You just need to look at politicians after elections. No matter how bad the results are, they will always discuss as if there are great winnings. And this happens in companies too. You need to define success and failure before you start to measure. There's another story about Snow White. Her stepmother was not happy with having a young girl in the house. And yeah, she always asked her mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all? And as long as the mirror told her, you are the fairest one of all, everything was fine for her. Then the day came where the mirror said, you are the fairest one, but there is Snow White. She became angry and she sends the huntsman out to kill Snow White, but he couldn't do this and he brought her away. And so the queen was assuming that Snow White is dead. Some years later, she again asked her mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all? And again, the mirror answered, you are the fairest one here, but Snow White. And she became so angry and she called the huntsman and, and she decided that she will do it on her own. And you know, there was a bad apple, the poison apple she gave her and she hoped that she will die. But it's fairy tale at the end, everything is okay. What went wrong? So the good thing was the queen asked for feedback. It was the mirror, but she asked for feedback. Yeah? The bad thing is she didn't want to hear the real feedback. She just wanted to hear what she wanted to hear. And when we ask for feedback, we should also listen to the things we don't want to hear because the most benefit is inside of them, because we can learn from them, although it's hard. If you don't want to hear them, don't ask for feedback. Yeah. And Cinderella, of course. Cinderella also with her stepmother and her two step sisters, she was the only one who had to, to do all the hard work in the house. And there was a prince, yes, we are fairy tale, talking about fairy tales, there's always a prince. And the prince was looking for a bride and he was giving a feast and her sisters are invited for this. And Cinderella usually had to stay at home, but there was a fairy, also again a fairy, uh, who gave her a nice dress and nice shoes and sh so she could go to the feast too. And what happened? The prince fell immediately in love with her. But there was one thing she had to follow. She had to be back at home before midnight. And it was just five minutes before 12. She had to leave and she was gone. And the prince went, where is she? This is exactly the, wo the woman I want to marry. So he gave another feast. The same thing happens again. And he did a third try. And he made the stairs stuck. And when Cinderella tried to get away, she lost one of her shoes. So now he had a chance. He sent out a lot of his soldiers to look for young women in his country. And they came to the house of Cinderella. But her parents just showed the other sisters and they should try the shoe, but the shoe didn't fit. 
what did the first sister do? She cut off her tooth. And she slipped into the shoe. And he said, okay, that's it. That's my bride. I take her with me. And she got on the horse. And they passed the pigeons again. And the pigeon says, cuckoo, cuckoo, blue blood is in the shoe. So, so he got feedback, and he looked down and said, okay, that's right, I need to bring her back. He asked for another sister, the same thing's happening. The second sister cut off her heel, and also, again, blood in the shoe, and he came back and said, there must be another one. And then Cinderella came, and he took on the shoe, and everything was fine, so, and they live happily, and you know the story. Again, we had the same airline thing, and hundreds of people, we're giving feedback. It does not work. The answer we got was just can't be. Try another browser. Restart your laptop. Switch the, the, the Wi-Fi. All those stuff were the answers we got, we as customers. So there was feedback and no one was checking what is this feedback about? It's not our failure. You, you all, 100, 200, 300 people who have problems, you all are too stupid to use your web browsers, to use websites. You are all too stupid. There was the chance for feedback, didn't take it. Another thing is what I see in companies when they decide, make decisions about processes and tools and methods. They try to use tools because everyone is using them without checking if these tools are good for the way they work, if they are good for their processes, just because everyone is using it. And believe me or not, I'm always asking the question, why are you using this? Yeah, because everyone is using it. Okay? And what's the reason behind it? Yeah, then it must be good. Yeah, it might be. But if it's good for you, this is the more important question, if it's right for you. Also the other way around. Does everyone need to use Kubernetes just because everyone is doing it? You need to find out, do we really need this now? Maybe later, but maybe now it's, the solution is too big or too, too hard for you to maintain can't be anything else, yeah? not just only Kubernetes, but as on this conference there was a lot about Kubernetes. This is, I, I think, a really good example for this. Do, does the solution fit to your needs? This is the same with Scrum and Kanban. I ask a lot of companies, why are you doing Scrum? Yeah, because everyone is doing it. it. Must be good. Yeah, but it does not fit to the way you work. Maybe Kanban might be the better approach. So, not only choose because other people tell you that it is, is good. Just make up your mind, it's more important. Patience you must have, my young Padawan, to find the right solution which is good for you. This is not just happening while going through a catalog of possibilities. <clears throat> There's no one-size-fits-all approach. You have to work on your individual solution. Tools and methods should support your way of working and your goal, not the other way around. You are not there for supporting the tool. And you have to be patient to find your perfect match. And also take feedback seriously. If you don't do this, forget about it. You can save a lot of time. Yeah. In a lot of stories, there's, told, there's been told that the king and the queen are coming to the town, and what is happening? Everyone is trying to clean up everything and to make it nice so that the king and the queen feel happy there, feel comfortable there. This is also happening in companies, especially when you work across, across departments. We don't want the other department to see the dirt which is around here. And we try to make it nice. And the Angel Manifesto says business people and developer must work together daily throughout the project. This does not make sense if we are not able to talk about the 
mud and the dirty things. Only if we address everything in the real world, we are able to find cool solutions. If we just pretend that everything is fine, how will we solve the problems? We need to address them. This is important. At a workshop, one guy told me, yeah, I understand, but <clears throat> when I do the A-B testing and the results are not what I think that my manager wants to hear, I do it again and again and again and again until I have the right numbers. Okay, you do it again and again until, yeah, until I have the right numbers. So, but that does not change anything. Yeah, but I know he wants to hear that. Is this helpful? Is this a helpful behavior? I don't think so. So the question is, why are we doing these tests? To make our products better or to just satisfy our manager? What is the real goal behind it? Always remember, when even in cross-functional projects, we are all on the same team, which means we have all the same goal at the end to be successful. We don't have the goal to tell the other what he wants to hear. We have the goal to come to our common goal, to our success. And therefore, we need to be honest about what's going on. In Alice Through the Looking Glass, Time says, you cannot change the past, though I dare you might learn something from it. And this is close to the fail fast approach. We can't change the past. But if things go wrong, we should stand up quickly, look what's went, what went wrong and go on. Go ahead. Don't stay there too long. Oh, I'm so sorry. I can't change the past, but oh, what have I done? Or if I could change the things. This does not help. We can't just change what's happening now and in the future but not what has happened in the past. We have a great tool inside of us. It's called the brain. Should be somewhere here. Let's try to always use it. And one discussion between Luke and Yoda was that Luke said, I can't believe it. I can't believe that I can do it. And Yoda said, This is exactly the reason why you fail, because you don't believe it. And also Alice in Wonderland says, to achieve the impossible, you need to believe it is possible. So I often hear, I can't change things going on in my company. I can't change culture because management does not want it. You can. You just need to believe it and you just need to start with yourself. Because culture is about human beings, culture is about habits. And you are all human beings, you all have your habits and you are all your master of yourself. So you are possible, you are able to change things and if you want, it is possible. Be smart, think, act, be agile and DevOps-like and If you have any questions, as we don't have time anymore, contact me. If you take the QR code, you have all the contact details, and just reach out for me. I will answer your questions. Thank you very much.